Well, the very warmest of welcomes to this week's Worship from the Wirral. My name is Mark Thomas and I'm the local lay pastor at Little Neston Methodist Church. My lectionary tells me that this is the last week, or the last Sunday, of the church year, and it's entitled the Festival of Christ the King. So we're at the end of one year and looking forward to the start of Advent, the beginning of a new church year. It's also the last week which we will spend in Luke's Gospel, and we will be taking our reading from there a little bit later on. But before we start, let's turn to our Heavenly Father in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your ongoing loving care, for the rhythm of the seasons, the springtime and the harvest. But Father, we are concerned that we live in a troubled world. In the last year, we have seen war break out in Europe. We've seen three prime ministers in our own country within months. We're faced by financial challenges and which seem to affect the poorest in our society most. But Lord, your message is a message of bringing peace to the world, goodwill to all people wherever they dwell. Father, give us the strength to proclaim the majesty of your rule as King of Kings and Lord of Lords to a world which is in dire need of good leadership. So, Lord, as we wait upon you now in an attitude of prayer, we ask for your blessing and we ask for your insight as we unfold eternal truths from your great word, the Bible. And together we pray the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. The splendor of the King God in majesty Let all the earth rejoice All the earth rejoice Oh God, all the sea of rain. 
lectionary provides an alternative for us today from a usual psalm. Thinking of the coming of Advent, we're given the option of reading what is known as the Benedictus, as recorded by Luke in the first chapter of his Gospel. This is the song of Zechariah, who was John the Baptist's father. If you remember, he was struck dumb due to his lack of faith at the announcement of the coming of his son, John. When the baby arrives, Zechariah affirms that yes, John was to be his name by writing it on a slate, and at that point his voice is restored and he breaks into this great song of praise. Well, we'll read it together, shall we? I'll read the plain type, and if you'd like to join in with the bold type, that would be great. Here we go. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, who has come to his people and set them free. He has raised up for us a mighty Saviour, born of the house of his servant David. Through his holy prophets, God promised of old to save us from our enemies, from the hands of all that hate us, to show mercy to our ancestors and to remember his holy covenant. This was the oath that God swore to our father Abraham, to set us free from the hands of our enemies, free to worship him without fear, holy and righteous in his sight all the days of our life. And you, child, shall be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his way, to give his people knowledge of salvation by the forgiveness of their sins. In the tender compassion of our God, the dawn from on high shall break upon us, to shine on those who dwell in darkness and the shadow of death, and to guide our feet into the way of peace. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be forever. Amen. As a preacher, I've really enjoyed my year in the Gospel of Luke. He's the great historian out of the four Gospel writers, the one with an eye for detail, the one who sets the words and the life of Jesus in a wider context, the context of the world at that time. Luke's great focus is upon Jesus' humanity, whereas, for example, John's Gospel focuses on Jesus' divinity. Each of the four Gospels has a different emphasis, so that when we read all of them, we get a really good rounded view of Jesus as the Messiah foretold, the servant king, perfect God, and yet perfect man. And because Jesus is the perfect man, he can provide the perfect sacrifice to make perfect atonement for our sins. He is our perfect saviour. Our last reading in Luke for this year takes us right to the pivot point of the whole of time and eternity, and that is the crucifixion of Jesus our Lord. The whole great redemption story of the Bible pivots upon this seminal event. This is the prime reason for him coming, so that he might die in order that we poor sinners might live. So let's turn to Luke chapter 23, and we're going to read from verses 33 to 43. When they came to the place that is called the Skull, they crucified Jesus there with the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they cast lots to divide his clothing, and the people stood by watching. But the leaders scoffed at him, saying, He saved others! Let him save himself, if he is the Messiah of God, his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine, and saying, If you're the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was also an inscription over him, 
This is the King of the Jews. One of the criminals who were hanged there kept deriding him and saying, Are you not the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed have been condemned justly, for we are getting what we deserve for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come in your kingdom. He replied, Truly, I tell you today you will be with me in paradise. It's always worth remembering that the Bible presents the crucifixion of Jesus to us as a triumph, certainly not a tragedy, and that Christ on the cross is actually a victor over sin and death and not a victim. Jesus has passed through the agony of the Garden of Gethsemane, where he struggles with what he knows is about to happen. But his prayers conclude with, Not my will, but thine be done. He knew it was his Father's will that he should suffer and die on the cross. I always remember visiting a couple of my Baptist friends at Christmas time and seeing that they had, in snow letters, painted on their front window, Born to Die. And I was struck by how profound that statement was. Jesus came to teach, yes. To heal, yes. To even raise people from the dead, yes. But his prime reason to come was to give his life for us. To pay the debt that we could not pay by paying a price that he did not owe. The Bible tells us that this great act of redemption was agreed between the Father and the Son before ever the world was created. The Apostle Peter, when preaching to the crowds on the day of Pentecost, tells them that Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with deeds of power, wonders and signs that God did through him amongst you, as you yourselves know, this man handed over to you according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of those outside the law. But God raised him up, having released him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for him to be held in its power. So Jesus' death is part of a divine plan, but those who are responsible for the deed bear their own personal human responsibility. In today's reading, we're introduced to a number of other characters. But in particular, I'd like to focus on the two thieves who were crucified with Jesus. They're mentioned in Mark's Gospel and in Matthew's Gospel. But it's only Luke who expands this. And in doing so, he gives us a cameo of the work of salvation itself. We have two thieves and two different responses to Jesus. And out of these two different responses comes two very different destinies for the thieves. They both want salvation of a sort, but one receives it and the other doesn't. We're told that the first criminal, the first thief, derides him saying, Are you not the Messiah? Save yourself and us! The thief is only too well aware of how dire his circumstances are. He was dying, pinned to a cross by a Roman execution squad. He'd obviously heard about Jesus and the claims that he was the Messiah. He may have even heard him preach or seen him do miracles. And in a very real sense, this man Jesus was his only hope. But it's clear his attitude is wrong and he doesn't really understand what Jesus has come to do. Jesus had the power to save himself, and the criminals as well, in a temporal sense. But Jesus could only truly be our saviour by not saving himself, by giving up his life. The attitude of the second thief is very different, and he rebukes the other thief, saying, do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? 
and we indeed have been condemned justly, for we are getting what we deserve for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. There is one vital ingredient that was missing in the first thief, but present in the response of the second, and that is repentance. There is no contrition in the words of the first thief, no remorse for a life ill-lived, just a total absorption in his own suffering and circumstances. The second thief acknowledges the justice of his situation, that he was receiving no less than he deserved for having broken the law. In a sense, he has judged himself and agreed that he was a sinner, deserving death. This is a powerful component of repentance, measuring ourself against God's holiness and recognizing our sinful nature and our sinful deeds. The Apostle Paul, writing to the church at Corinth, tells them that if they would judge themselves, then they would not be judged. And the holiness of God's moral law challenges us to judge ourselves by these standards. This second thief not only judges himself as guilty, but also recognizes that Jesus hanging next to him is completely innocent. He says this man has done nothing wrong, and the Bible presents to us Jesus as our perfect saviour because of his purity. The writer to the Hebrews reminds us that this is the kind of high priest we need, holy, innocent, undefiled, separated from sinners, and now exalted above the heavens. The second thief now turns his attention to Jesus and says, Jesus, remember me when you come in your kingdom. And by referring to Jesus' kingdom, he is recognizing Jesus as king. And Jesus responds, truly, I tell you today, you will be with me in paradise. This little cameo in Luke's Gospel has a great deal to tell us about the nature of our salvation. I have lost count of the number of times people have told me that you get to heaven, to God's kingdom, by living a good life. But this man had not lived a good life. He had no good works to offer Jesus as a reason why he should be admitted to heaven. All he had to offer to Jesus was just his repentance. He is throwing himself on God's mercy, recognizing that if he was to be forgiven, if he was to enter heaven, it would be an act of complete grace and nothing that he had earned or in any way deserved. So we have two sinners, the two thieves. We have two attitudes and we have two destinies. One entered paradise that day, the other did not.
And so to our final prayers. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the example that we've seen of Jesus' care and concern for a dying thief. Help us to recognise that we are in just the same need of forgiveness and grace as those thieves were. Help us to recognise that we're saved purely by an act of your divine grace and not on the basis of anything that we've deserved. And Lord, we thank you that you came as a baby in order to die in our place, that we might live in eternity in our Heavenly Father's house. And may the love of God be shed abroad in your hearts by the Holy Spirit who is given for us, that we might know the height and breadth and length and depth of God's redeeming love. May the grace of God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit rest upon your souls and give you great peace. Amen. <laughs>